race at the Cirque, which is about 13,000 feet high, and it's 11.5 miles into the race. And of course, the last time we saw Scott Elliott, he was in second at Bar Camp. Now he's overtaken. He's back in number one with a big lead over Walter Sargent. It's interesting here because they were neck and neck coming out of the Bar Camp, and he's opened up a couple hundred meters at this point. You see the water station. It's interesting that Scott actually stops there cold turkey almost and gets a glass of water. Not a bad idea because what it does is gives your, your chance, your legs a chance to take a little break and you can just kind of catch your breath. You see him looking at his watch there. He told me after the race he really wanted to keep track of his time because he wants that triple crown of running title. Right now he's in good shape to win it. That's right. It's interesting because he's not so much concerned about Sargent as he is about John Escobel. He wants to know where John is. There's Walter Sargent speaking of Walter. He looks a little stiff right there. You can see by the anguish on his face that he's hurting. In fact, he's leaning forward almost as if he wants to get this thing over with very quickly. That's right. You can see he's uh, hunched over a little bit there. His stride is not that strong at this point. He's really struggling. And the kazoo players are there. A great shot by our camera crew showing the distance between number one and number two. You saw Sargent there and there is Elliot who has almost a 30 to 40 second lead right now. Yeah, you have to remember that Scotty has spent the last two weeks up here on the bar trail and really familiarizing himself with his course. And there's Sargent you see going behind the rock and Elliot coming back out on at least two trails higher. So you see he's got at least a 40 second lead right there and he's looking a lot stronger than Sargent. Well, I tell you, you have to give a lot of credit to Sargent. There's number three, Michael Tobin. Has a little better stride right now. Looks a little bit stronger than Sargent does, but then again, Sargent has that big lead. Tactically, Sargent ran a very smart race, running head-to-head -head with uh, Scotty through the bar camp. There's number four, Brent Frias, who's looking pretty strong right there. We'll come back down. This is John Escobel coming up. The fans are cheering him on. Of course, he is the Triple Crown leader going into this event, but he's struggling right now. You can see that his arms aren't moving very fast. His legs aren't going up very high, so you can tell he's hurting. That's right. This course really blesses the mountain runners. He is not truly a mountain runner. He really does this in addition to his flatline racing. So uh, he is not well prepared for this particular course. And he's leaning forward. It's got to be a hard sign. It's got to be hard in the small of his back. It also has to be hard on his legs because he's actually leaning forward on the mountain. That's right. And uh, hit right now, his legs are screaming for oxygen. He hasn't been up to this altitude recently. You can see right here, he's cutting his stride. He'll use his hand to push off the rock. There he goes right there. There's not much oxygen, as we mentioned, so these runners have to work very hard. You can see there's the sixth place runner. The pack runners, by the time they get up here, the oxygen level is going to be hard on them. You can imagine what it is on these the elite runners that are running very fast. That's right. You lose about 3% every 1,000 feet you go up. It's like driving a car up the peak. It gets weaker and weaker as you go up. Here's a good shot of the rest of the leaders going back up the top. You can tell the distance they're going straight up here. We mentioned earlier that right about bar camp, it kind of levels out. You get a little bit of a break, but there's no break right here. These guys are going almost straight up a mountain. That's right, and there's a lot of race walking involved here. Actually, it's more efficient at 10, 12, 14,000 feet to race walk than it is actually to run. Now, speaking of race walking, they're actually doing that right here. It's a lot more efficient. You get better time, and here's the lead woman. Lynn Brownow is in good shape. She looks almost happy when she goes past her cruise. It's amazing because the women tend to pace themselves a little bit better than the men do and they tend to smile and say hello to the crowd, wave to the crowd. They're, they're very content at this level. Here's Janie Day who's made up a lot of time. Last time we saw Janie she was in fourth or fifth place. Now she is in second and looking quite strong. Yes, yeah, she really ran a very smart tactical race. You can see at the beginning she started off very slow and really worked herself into the race here. Now she's run it so many times that she actually has a good idea of what she's doing. As opposed to the pack runners you're seeing right here, the distance you can see, they've got to be a little bit frustrated now because they are in a, a solid line. They can't move very fast but maybe again they don't want to move very fast. They're looking very good though still. Here's a great shot of the Cirque. The bottom of the Cirque, we're going to go all the way back up to the top. It's a great uh, shot by our camera crew, but not a very good uh, position to be in if you're trying to run up a mountain. There's a lot of work there involved at this, uh, this elevation. There's 16 golden steers. You're starting to get back up. And look at the guy way up there. That's John Escobel. He is hurting definitely. He's not used to running these mountains. And it takes an awful lot of energy to run a mountain like this. And where does the energy come from? Well, it comes from good nutrition. Kurt Sandoval has more. To challenge Pikes Peak is to challenge oneself. And when it's just you against this mountain, every little extra bit can help. If there's one way these runners can possibly cut a corner to the top, it just might be through nutrition. An uh, endurance athlete, someone who's going to do the ascent or the full marathon, needs to have some storage um, carbohydrate in the form of glycogen in order to um, endure the whole event. Glycogen, that's the body's carbohydrate. And in an endurance event as tough as this one, the more fuel you'll have, the farther you'll go. What you can do with your diet is eat a real, you can eat a real high carbohydrate diet. We call it carbohydrate loading for three days. 
um, in advance of the event and you can double or triple the amount of glycogen that you store in your muscles and then you will you'll just be able to last a lot longer before you fatigue or again hit the wall while the run up the mountain may take hours it's truly a waste of time and energy to eat during this race I think that it's wise not to eat while you're running up there. You want your blood to be going to your muscles, to be providing, providing oxygen to your muscles. And if you eat, some of that blood has to go to your stomach. That's less oxygen to your muscles. And on the peak, oxygen is hard to come by. It just seems to look up and think, wow, that's a long way up still. Two miles usually is pretty short, but not today. You know, when these runners have made it this far, it's more than carbohydrate loading that got them here. In fact, it's one heck of a lot of determination. For the Pikes Peak Marathon, I'm Kurt Sandoval, Sports 13. Well, let's hope these athletes took Julie's and Kurt's advice because they're going to need all the energy they can get to finish. Well, that for you right after this.